Well, hi there. This is Andy Stoker, and I am offering uh, what I delivered on May 26th to uh, our Sunday school hour as part of a six week series on what it means to be a United Methodist. Uh, so we had some te technical difficulties on Sunday morning, so you'll have to excuse this recording uh, as part of our time together, but at least I can get you the information so that you can go back and review or, um, or watch it entirely. Um, we hope to record all, the, all five of them and, and discern um, the problem in the Central Life Center, but in the meantime, you've got me here in the office um, early in the morning and, uh, and ready to give you uh, the presentation I gave. Uh, a little uh, a little bit about what I'm what I'm up to is I'm going to show a slideshow and then uh, and move through uh, the slides we actually uh, participated in. Many of the slides I didn't get a chance to uh, to go through. I had too much presentation <laughs> as as usual um, and not enough time. So uh, I'll integrate some of those slides as we move through uh, the course of June. And you'll be able to see those uh, moving forward. Also, I have um, a works cited sheet and then a sheet on um, what's called what I what I called a very short history of the etymological arrival of the word homosexual in the 20th century Bible. So it's just a one pager. I'm glad to get it to you um, out there. But uh, but in the meantime, let's uh, let's lean into where we were last Sunday uh, in our time together. So um, as I like to do, I like to pray before I give any presentation. So uh, let's pray together. Living God, give you thanks for technology when it works and when it doesn't work. And now I give you thanks for um, this experience that we have to share thoughts and reactions about who we are not only as Christians, but also as United Methodists uh, who have a particular and unique view of theology and spirituality when it comes to organizing ourselves and also listening more deeply to the spirit. May it be so in my organization that in whatever disorganization I have, that you make it perfect, O oh God, in whatever life that we have to share, that we become perfected in love through your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's get started. So the title of the presentation is Now What? Untied United Methodism. Uh, now What? Untied United Methodism. Uh, we have been through quite a lot over the last several years. Um, we had to postpone our 2020 general conference that was to happen in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, and we postponed it to August 29th uh, through September 6th of 2022. And still we could not get um, vaccinations. Um, we were riding the waves. If you recall this, we were riding the waves of, um, of new variants of COVID-19. And also our beloved across the globe couldn't receive visas in time to come because of COVID-19, vaccination status, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we postponed it from 2022 to 2024. In the meantime, um, in this postponement from General Conference 2019 to 2024, there was the rise of what was the global Methodist Church. The Global Methodist Church are mostly disaffiliating churches that decided to um, form their own denomination. Now, the irony here is that General Conference 2019 actually doubled down on restrictions of marrying and ordaining same gender loving people. Um, so, for all intents and purposes, the uh, what was the Wesleyan Covenant Association at the time, the Global Methodist Church, the burgeoning Global Methodist Church, actually they they won the day, and yet they still 
self-selected out of uh, the denomination which I find fascinating and maybe for an offline conversation, we can uh, chat about that. Uh, it's interesting from an organizational behavior perspective and also um, from a theological case. Uh, so uh, there's a, a weighing of the short-term versus long-term, a weighing of what it might look like for, uh, for persons to, uh, frankly, uh, affirm who they are um, in the short in the short term and ensure that they're taken care of, but not thinking about the long term. But that's for another day and time entirely. So we've had significant uh, disaffiliations. Churches have closed since the pandemic, and so the United Methodist Church has become untied in a lot of ways. Uh, and so leading up to General Conference 2024, April 23rd to May 3rd, 2024, we met in Charlotte, North Carolina for, um, for those 10 or so days. And we, we determined uh, what we were going to be. With all of the disaffiliating churches and church closures, the felt sense of General Conference was entirely different. Um, for years, the conversation has been uh, in the first two days around <laughs> uh, around the rules. Um, what are the rules of of the conference, and how are we how are we moving from here? Well, this time the rules took a little little less than two hours uh, to determine. Um, at most, I think it was twelve and a half hours of talking about the rules, how we're gonna organize ourselves. And that took quite a long time. So it was already different after day one. Let me give a, a breakdown of um, who was at General Conference. This is the postponed 2020 General Conference um, in Charlotte. So 862 voting delegates, half clergy, half lay people, 55.9% of the delegates are from the United States. 32% from the continent of Africa, 6% from the Philippines, and 4.6% from Europe. Uh, there are four official written languages um, in uh, uh, for, for the United Methodist Church, English, French, Kiswahili, and Portuguese. And 10, ten languages are spoken via interpreters on site. So we're really trying to grow an inclusive church. What does it look like to be a radically in inclusive church? At this general conference, what we determined um, on day one is to not hear any legislative items. Um, we voted actually to not hear any legislative items uh, that were around disaffiliation, that were around um, anybody who uh, now disaffiliated that wrote legislation. We weren't going to uh, hear those in our legislative committees. And we also uh, knew and understood that we were not going to uh, listen to or determine any further action being done with disaffiliation. This came up at the very end of our time together, um, May 1st or 2nd on those few last days was what happens, dear friends, when we have disaffiliating churches or clergy or members who want to return to the United Methodist Church? Um, there was a lot of talk about grace, a lot of talk about what it looks like for us to um, lean into our better angels. At the end of the day, there was a, a friendly amendment accepted uh, on the floor of General Conference that we would accept any church clergy person or congregation member back into the United Methodist Church as long as they agreed to the trust clause of the United Methodist Church. The trust clause is what holds all of us united and together, that uh, the local church holds in trust the annual conferences property. Um, that's what keeps us connectional. The annual conference, so the New Mexico annual conference owns the property that Central is on and has built on. We are stewards 
of the annual conference's property. So that's what keeps us a connectional church. Keeps us, uh, what I like to think is that we are more of a covenantal church when it comes to people, and we're a connectional church when it comes to property. Uh, ooh, I kind of like that. Okay, moving on. I'll stop impressing myself here in just a minute. <laughs> it's hard to be all alone. I missed you this last Sunday. All right, here we go. Uh, United Methodists around the world. This is a global map of the United Methodist Church as of 2016. These are the spaces around the world. The um, yellow spaces around the world are um, spaces where we do not have a united Methodist presence. Now there may be a united, or, sorry, a Methodist presence, but not a united Methodist presence. For example, in India, uh, in India, we have um, right here, we have a beautiful connection in India. Um, I had an opportunity actually to preach um, in New Delhi at the Cent uh, Centenary um, United or Centenary Methodist Church in New Delhi, and it is 115 years old, and it was a glorious opportunity. But there are Methodists in India that believe that. Um, in Jesus Christ, obviously, and that the Methodist way of being, that is um, do no harm, do good, stay in love with God, that's attending to the ordinances of God, uh, deep belief in God's grace, provenient, justifying, sanctifying grace. So there are Methodist presence, but not United Methodist. Um, let's look a little closer at um, United Methodists around the world. Total church membership in the um, United States is 5.4 million, and then outside the United States, 4.5 million. Total active churches, a little less than 30,000 in the United St States, and across the globe, um, a little less than 10,000. Clergy membership, um, a little less than 37,000 clergy in the United States, whereas there's a little over 12,000 clergy across the globe. Average weekly worship attendance is 3.1 million in the United States and 2.45 uh, million in, across the globe. What you'll see here is that um, the average worship attendance is broken down in person and online um, in the United States, which you can see the shift to online uh, there, this this report was from 2022. Um, so fascinating to see that that shift, and maybe enlightening for us who uh, are asking ourselves, where is everyone? <laughs> Hopefully, they're online, or over half of us are online, right? Um, annual conferences: we have 53 in the United States, 80 across the globe. Episcopal areas: we have 46 in the United States and 20 across the globe. Five jurisdictions in the U.S. and seven in uh, across the globe. So, just United Methodists around the world. There, a brief numbered snapshot. Now, let's take a look at the United Methodist jurisdictions and annual conferences around the United States. You see, we're here. The New Mexico annual conference is here, and we dip into um, far west Texas, my hometown, right here, El Paso. Um, and we're up here, Albuquerque. Um, we're part of the South Central jurisdiction. The South Central jurisdiction is made up of all these. Um, I think it is do 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 eight states, and then we have um, these annual conferences that are within those eight states. Here's the Western jurisdiction, North Central jurisdiction, Northeastern jurisdiction, and Southeastern jurisdiction. Um, this will, uh, when I talk a little bit about regionalism here in a few minutes, this will make more sense about what it looks like for us to be a more contextual and regionalized church. Um, so we'll, we'll get there. I promise. All right, let's go to the 30,000 foot view. There are three governing bodies of the United Methodist Church. The United Methodist Church is a democratic, uh, institution. That is to say that the power of the people is, uh, is, has representatives so that every voice is represented and has a place at the table. 
The general conference is our legislative branch. And that general conference meets every four years, barring a pandemic or another global um, concerns. Uh, but general conference generally meets every four years, or the Methodist term is every quadrennia. Our executive branch are the Council of Bishops. Our judicial branch is our judicial council. These three governing bodies provide checks and balances so that we can continue to uh, nurture and sustain our vision and mission for the United Methodist Church, which is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Uh, all of this to say is that much of, of our attention uh, at the local church level happens around general conference, and then we're separated into annual conferences, uh, regions that have, um, let's go back to the jurisdictional map. So annual conferences, you see New Mexico here is an annual conference. That means we meet once a year. The Desert Southwest meets once a year. Rocky Mountain Conference meets once a year. Great Plains meets once a year. So we have, uh, we have these annual conferences and we're held together by these smaller regions. Uh, most of our attention on the local church level happens at this, uh, on, on the legislative side. Annual conferences, local churches, districts, annual conferences, jurisdictional conferences, and then our general conference. So you see there is a methodology, there's an order to how we live out our United Methodist faith. Okay, so let's talk about uh, general conference and this last general conference and a few uh, of the top concerns uh, that were that garnered the most attention that many of you all saw on social media, in the news, etc. The first was uh, there was an impasse with um, U.S. centrism or what we called regionalization. Regionalization is. Um, has been on the docket for about 24 years in the United Methodist Church. Um, so we've been talking about what it means to be a connectional church uh, unified around one book of discipline and one um, book of resolutions. Well, here has been the ongoing uh, chasm that has grown through the years is that um, when we go to general conference, we uh, are oftentimes um, focusing, especially when it comes to money, focusing on United States matters. So um, regionalization would actually give um, the United States its own, what's called a central conference. Central conferences outside the United States are commonplace and have been so since 1968. Those central conferences have been established with their own understanding of how they ordain folks, um, their own process for finances, how they support annual conferences and even the central conference. Um, and the United States delegates do not vote in those central conferences. However, as the years have passed, um, the global church has grown dramatically and the US church has shrunk. And still there's a lot of information, a lot of legislation that is coming through that is entirely US centric and contextual to the United States. The global church has a vote in United States matters. The United States does not have a vote in central conference matters. So there's been this discrepancy. It came to a head, and as I indicated on this last Sunday, and I'll indicate to you, where we were discussing two uh, point, really it's a, it was a decimal difference um, on a pension plan that we were looking at. And so there were a lot of speeches about how we raised pension from 4.7 to 4.8%, for clergy in the United States, so on and so forth. One of our beloved from 
uh, the globe got up and said, this is what we at the global church level don't want to hear about. We are wasting time. We need to get um, we need to get inspired and energized around the work that we need to do when we go back home. Um, our pastors are making eight dollars a day, and we are spending hours um, quibbling about uh, a decimal difference on a pension program uh, for U.S. clergy. So it became very clear um, early on in our discussions that regionalization was going to um, win the day. As a matter of fact, seven of the eight um, uh, petitions did pass. We're waiting on the eighth petition to pass. That eighth petition would make a constitutional change, which requires a two-thirds majority vote um, across the globe in every annual conference. That vote will likely come up in 2025 and will be counted by 2026. And then we can potentially, if it passes, start the regional regionalization um, organizational process then in 2026. But all signs point to this regional model being far more contextual in our understanding of who we are as United Methodists in Albuquerque or in our neighborhoods across the globe. Likewise, um, regionalization uh, and increased contextualization helps the conversation around ordaining and marrying same gender loving couples, um, engaging more fervently with uh, indigenous populations, um, uh, fervently, faithfully, and um, more compassionately with indigenous populations, native populations, First Nations people um, across the connection as well. So um, I'm excited about this kind of thing. I think Albuquerque, uh, especially Central United Methodist Church can, can represent this very, very well. Um, we've got some work to do when it comes to racial and uh, ethnic justice, but, um, but I think that that's part of our own context and more learning that we have to do together to uh, to come come together with a unified approach uh, to who we are and how we want to serve. The second impasse was um, over revised social principles. You see, um, in our book of discipline, in our book of discipline, since 1972, um, there has been a phrase in the Book of Discipline, and that phrase is homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. Uh, this phrase actually is, um, is in our social principles. Um, it's not in our constitution. It's not in our articles of religion. And yet it has hold, held such significant sway that even in chargeable offenses of clergy, it ranks the top two offenses that clergy can be excused from ministry on around the incompatibility phrase. Um, there's a great comic book that uh, just came out a few weeks ago by Charlie Baber. And he writes these really funny uh, comics around John Wesley, but uh, it's called Incompatible, How the Church Cast Out LGBTQ Christians and Where We Go Next. It's a great um comic and has some really wonderful um, conversations about um, how we got here with this incompatibility phrase. Um, remember that this incompatibility phrase and our state, statement around ordination and marriage come from our social principles that um, have been ratified at the general conference level, level, but not in annual conferences. So it's not constitutional. It's not in our articles of faith. Uh, it's not in our general rules, and yet it has held significant sway. So there has been a uh, process by which we have uh, wanted to engage in um, revising those social principles, um, really getting to the meat of what Jesus was talking about when it comes to uh, major social and political concerns. Um, Marriage is a, a social and per, political concern when it comes to abuse, when it comes to violence, et cetera. 
uh, we stand squarely against all of that. Um, uh, two committed, loving people coming together under the covenant of their baptisms um, seems to be where much of the conversation has been about um, how that person is attracted to a different gender or the same gender. Revised social principles now streamlines this, and it's really an invitation to a global call of social action. This kind of social action has been part of our part of the Methodist movement for over a hundred years. As a matter of fact, when my sermon gets boring this next week or in the coming weeks, you can look in the back of the hymnal in our creeds, and you can find at the very back of our hymnal the Methodist social creed, which is a rabidly liberal <laughs> uh, creed that was developed in the 1910s and 20s in the Methodist church uh, in the United States. And so um, we, we come by our progressive nature um, very honestly. And traditionally, this is where we have been in caring for our beloved. Okay, so let's get into the third and probably uh, the biggest impasse. Um, according to the news and others, is our restrictive language. Uh, the reason why I say um, this restrictive language is has been of, um, of importance to the news and others is because I think this is just a symptom of a bigger dis-ease in our organization in the United Methodist Church that we need to talk about. So I'll get to that here, but let's, let's um, Let's navigate through this in what I just indicated with the social principles and then where the restrictive language actually shows up. Um, the word homosexual is a new word. As a matter of fact, it's only about 120 years old. Um, we had not had that kind of terminology uh, before. Um, We've had a variety of ways where people are connected, um, uh, that same gender loving people, uh, what that uh, sexual orientation has been uh, called through the years has changed. But the word homosexual is a relatively new word in the English language. Paragraph 161F in the Book of Discipline uh, 2016, I bolded this, you can, you can read most of it here. I bolded uh, where the incompatibility phrase comes in. The United Methodist Church does not condone the practice of homosexuality and considers this practice incompatible with Christian teaching. Um, I had a friend in, a, <laughs> in one of my last churches who said, oh, I, I don't practice homosexuality, I've perfected it, <laughs> which I thought is really hilarious. Anyway, um, so he thought he was above the incompatible incompatibility phrase because um, he no longer practices homosexuality. He's perfected it. Um, but this is this is part of it. Another section of our um, uh, book of discipline is in paragraph 304.3, .3, qualifications for ordination, another restrictive phrase. Here again, bolded. Uh, a self-avowed practicing homosexual. They are not to be certified as candidates, ordained as ministers, or appointed to serve the United Methodist Church. Um, yet another, another restriction here, paragraph 304.3. .3. In the Book of Discipline 2016, paragraph 341.6, homosexual unions, as they're still called, uh, even though um, 2015 uh, in the United States, um, was uh, we ratified a federal um, federal law saying that um, same gender loving people can be married to one another. Um, 341.6 homosexual unions, homosexual unions should not be conducted by our ministers and shall, shall not be conducted in our churches. Remember, all of this here is uh, not constitutional. Then we have um, I think this is where um, General Conference 2016 uh, flipped the script on chargeable offenses for clergy. So this is 
deeply troubling to me because it um, indicates a, uh, a a kind of criminal um, attitude toward same gender loving people. So let's, I'm just going to go through this. Uh, I want to spend a little extra time here. I know I don't have a whole lot of time, but a little extra time here. Um, a bishop, clergy member of an annual conference, local pastor, clergy, clergy on honorable or administrative location, diaconal minister may be tried when charged with one or more of the following offenses. The first two involve um, persons who are same gender loving persons. Immorality, um, including but not limited to not being celibate in singleness or faithfulness or faithful in a heterosexual marriage or, and that's targeted specifically, uh, I believe, um, because in the practice of um, celibacy and singleness and faithfulness and heterosexual marriage, um, there have been multiple, multiple cases over the last 52 years where um, quote unquote heterosexual mostly men are able to keep their credentials and continue to serve in the church, even after um, a breaking celibacy or being unfaithful in their marriage. But I digress. B, practices declared by the United Methodist Church to be incompatible with Christian teaching, which is including but not limited to being a self-avowed practicing homosexual, conducting ceremonies which celebrate homosexual unions, or performing same-sex wedding ceremonies. That Those are the top two, friends. Number three is crime. Crime. Number four, disobedience to the order of discipline in the United Methodist Church. Number five, dissemination of doctrines contrary to the United Methodist Church. Six, relationships and or behavior that undermines the ministry of another pastor. Seven, child abuse. Eight, sexual abuse. Nine, sexual misconduct, including use or possession of pornography. 10, harassment. 11, racial or gender discrimination. 12, fiscal malfeasance. Um, this was in our book of discipline until this last general conference. And in this last general conference, we decided to eradicate all of this um, harmful, oppressive, and margin, uh, uh, language that seeks to marginalize and marginalize and exclude and harm um, our beloved across the connection. So um, that's what it said. That was part of the impasse in 2019, 2024, and certainly over the last 52 years. I'm going to skip the next uh, couple of slides because we're going to cover them. Uh, in week three of this, when we talk about um, our tradition. Uh, it's a history of schism, which I have a field day on and absolutely love to talk about. Okay. So as I said earlier, um, that these impasses and especially our really radical focus on um, same gender loving couples and quote unquote homosexuality for years is a symptom of a larger disease, dis-ease of the organization. I believe this is Andy Stoker talking, not the general conference. This is Andy Stoker talking. I believe that the disease um, are, it settles around two things. Um, first is United Methodists have not have a, had a substantive conversation around biblical authority. Um, we have been infiltrated by a cultural Christianity that sees the Bible as literally true. And we have not had a conversation about um, John Wesley's understanding of, of the Bible in his context, how many of our seminaries are teaching the Bible. Um, I would say in, in very general terms, uh, you would be hard, hard, hard pressed to find a biblical theologian in a United Methodist seminary that's teaching um, teaching biblical literalism. Um, and we're going to talk about the Bible in session two. Um, and so we're here here we are. 
um, biblical authority. I don't know where you land on this, but um, I can't wait to have a more substantive conversation so that we could stop getting distracted um, with what if something is right or wrong. Like um, in 1845, uh, that slavery was somehow a right or wrong issue. Um, uh, so because we could justify it with the Bible, um, literally speaking, uh, we could justify it from the Bible. And somehow we got away from that. We don't see the Bible as literally true when it comes to slavery. Um, we've been ordaining women for over 75 years in the United Methodist Church. What does that look like, dear friends? Um, when the Bible literally says um, that a woman should not um, have power or authority over a man, <laughs> but somehow we've interpreted it differently. Okay, I digress. We'll talk a little bit more about that in our Bible week, and I hope one-on-one uh, -on -one in our Sunday school classes and small groups. Number two, the big issue is money. The world's um, most popular disease, <laughs> sorry, a little Freudian slip. The world's most popular religion is not Christianity, it is capitalism. We have not done a good job of squaring what Jesus literally says about money um, and his idea of money, his idea of God's generosity, his idea of abundance, care for the poor, um, what it looks like to, uh, to celebrate years of jubilee, uh, alleviating debt, et cetera. We've not had a substantive conversation about money because we can, um, we're not supposed to talk about uh, religion, money or politics. Um, but yet it seems like that's all Jesus ever talked about <laughs> uh, in his day and time. But uh, so these, are, I think that this is part of the disease is that we haven't had those conversations. I certainly am not afraid to have these conversations. I think they're going to, they will help us be a stronger church and potentially strengthen Christianity. Um, the last thing we want is to have us ignore these bigger, broader issues that are actually threatening the very, the very core of Jesus's clear message about what it means to love God and love neighbor. We need to have these conversations. Uh, I'll talk more about this as we as we move through um, our time together. Now, uh, I give a couple of petitions along the way. Um, let me go back, give a couple petitions along the way about regionalization, which I think is important. We'll talk a little bit more about it um, when we uh, on our week when we talk about experience um, and what we understand in the United Methodist Church about our lived experience in certain contexts. Part of our lived experience in our certain context is also about how money is used. Um, this is the strangest pie chart I've ever seen. It's almost like you didn't have to make a pie chart for this because it's so dramatic. So 98% of the proposed budget for the next four years in the United Methodist Church comes from the United States, 98%. 2% comes from our from the rest of the world. You may recall that 55% of United Methodists are United States. So um, we, we hold the greatest amount of money that we need to do, that we need to have to support the global, this global movement called the United Methodist Church. Um, and we're only 55% of the total population. So we are reducing um, our budget over the next four years by 42 percent. Uh, this is dramatic. A lot of um, a lot of what we came to expect would uh, from the denomination is going to go away or be repurposed. Um, so a 43 percent reduction for jurisdictional conferences to pay in and then a 10 percent reduction for the central conferences to pay in. Uh, so just so you know this is kind of where we are. We're not going to really see a benefit here at Central about that, uh, about uh, the overall budget. I do believe that paying our apportionments or our what we call in this conference shared ministry giving um, is vitally important because we are saying 
with our uh, what we say what with a value system <laughs> uh, that is money that we're investing in a connectional system. We're investing in people around the world to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Um, so I think this is this is a good feature for us to continue. Um, and that budget passed um, after some uh, a little bit of conversation on the last day, but it finally passed um, there. Um, the next to last day, there was an amazing vote uh, that removed all of the uh, harmful language. That's me in Charlotte, North Carolina after the vote. Um, and I'm wearing my pin that I wore all week long uh, that says, you can be yourself around me with the pride flag on top and the trans flag on, on the bottom. Um, I just, at being an ally in the community, I want to make sure that I'm able to talk to folks uh, holistically and carefully um, as we navigate through. So it's a joy to serve Central. Um, so I hope you see that in my face right there. <laughs> All right. So um, coming to the end of our presentation, where do we go from here, Central United Methodist Church? Where do we go from here? Um, three slides on this. Um, we must remain vocal and active. Um, silence oftentimes is complicity. So being vocal and active helps us um, to be on the front edge, the front lines of what it looks like to be a faithful church working to love God and love neighbor. So with God's help, we continue our advocacy to work with all of those who have who have and are still experiencing a second class status. Um, we need to deepen our presence in places of pain and suffering. And then by the help and, and being led by the Holy Spirit, we stand together against institutionalized preference for one group over another. Um, I think in large part, you heard me say a few weeks ago that uh, my apology, uh, using my privilege to distance myself um, from those that the institution was otherizing. Uh, I think it's, it's time for me uh, to be vocal and active as well as all of us. Uh, we need to be far more collaborative. We belong to a denomination, and so we're going to continue to be present and share our money. Um, presence is probably far more important than anything else. Uh, I was told by my grandmother that um, people will, uh, will never remember the words that you say, but will always remember that you're there. Um, so being present is a huge piece. That's why I think uh, going to... Uh, being, being present in pride, uh, in our pride events in Albuquerque, uh, standing with our indigenous siblings, um, uh, advocating for racial justice. Um, so th these are all ways that we can remain present, especially as a predominantly white congregation. Um, this is countercultural. This is a way of, of uh, utilizing our, our privilege and our power that actually helps us to um, see the very essence of what I believe Jesus was about. Um, and because we're the body of Christ, we won't stand alone. We need to be collaborative to work with other churches, districts, conferences, to open up possibilities for the future. And we will be a louder voice for justice within the institutional church. Uh, I think we can start that right here in the Albuquerque district. Um, and I think Central is the perfect place for that kind of work. The last slide on, on this is leadership. Um, uh, with God's help, we will engage better in our worship, education, and mission ministries. Um, increasing communication, dear friends, is a hard, hard thing. Um, creating a feedback loop with you is has been a difficult thing. So um, I'm going to do my very best to engage better in worship, education, and mission. And I really would love your feedback. Um, let's find ways to deepen our, our relationship and grow together. Uh, focused on Jesus Christ, we will do all that we can to make Central Church healthy, hospitable, safe, up-to-date, and present um, for our neighborhood. Um, I, I, you all are already doing the hospitable thing. Uh, we're, we're leaning into some healthy, healthy behaviors. Um, we are pretty good on safety. Um, 
caring for our some of our uh, building and staying present in, present in our community is going to be our growing edge. But I know that together we can get this done. And I know that many of you um, in your hearts and heads, this is something that you've wanted for a long time. Uh, let's rise together and make it happen. Um, and the last thing by way of leadership is by the Holy Spirit, we can no longer trust silence by way of affirmation. Um, we must vocalize, um, getting active. Um, leadership is a serious behavior, but it doesn't have to be a serious act. <laughs> we can laugh along the way. We can cry along the way. We can um, we can assist each other along the way. We can lift each other up. Um, being silent uh, and sitting on our hands is no longer needed or wanted. Uh, the generations that are going to follow us, um, my children, um, I with uh, uh, in in some way, uh, my grandchildren, either voluntaristically or biologically. Uh, they're going to be looking to us. What did we say in these times of difficulty? What did we do when uh, when people who are marginalized by predominantly white a predominantly white majority? Uh, what were we doing as a predominantly white church? Um, what were we saying? What were we doing? Uh, were we putting our um, reputations on the line? Were we putting our dollars on the line? Were we putting our lives on the line? Uh, to to shape a more um, a more grace filled place. So your questions are always wanted, friends. A Stoker at centraltolife.org. That's my email address. Do not hesitate to send that. Stop me on a Sunday morning. Let's make an appointment together to chat. Um, we're in this together. Uh, I, I can't emphasize that enough. And speaking about that. I have fallen in love with a poet from England named Robert McFarlane. Robert McFarlane wrote this amazing book um, called The Old Ways, where he was, a, it's really a travel log about him hiking all over England uh, and talking about what old traditions were and old pathways and that kind of thing. Well, in the, um, in his subsequent hikes uh, with his students at Oxford University, um, he stopped and saw this beautiful cliff with waterfalls. Um, and it was um, in the, the bottom of the cliff here is this um, orangey moss colored uh, or orange, orange colored moss that was sort of hanging in the balance, if you, if you will. And he decided to, um, to riff a little bit on um, what he wanted, what he was indicating um, by his own way of seeing that as painting a word picture around an angle of repose. He says, the angle of repose is the maximum angle at which a slope of loose material stays stable with the bonds of friction just exceeding the demands of gravity. Figuratively, of a human life or community, the angle of repose is the tense point where hanging together still beats falling apart. Hanging together still beats falling apart. Friends, we are in this together, in this untied United Methodist Church. And we have the opportunity to shape a worldview where the love of God through Jesus Christ and that love through Jesus Christ offered to us through the Holy Spirit is our guidance, our care, and ultimately our liberation and salvation. In the coming weeks, I hope and pray that you're blessed by these experiences that we have together. Let's keep it open. Um, let's, let's hold loosely uh, to what is, uh, has been taken so seriously um, and divisively through the years. Let's embrace our differences. Let's uh, discern together that when someone asks us a question or that when someone says something that we disagree with, that we patiently sit by and ask them and say, how did you get there? Tell me how your life story indicates the truth about what you just said. 
and maybe just maybe understanding people's contexts and away from those sound bites helps us know a little bit more about where their pain is, where their suffering has been. And we can be a light of hope, of care, and be wounded healers ourselves for a world desperately crying out for help and for hope. May it be so for us, my dear friends, because hanging together really beats falling apart. God bless you, and we'll see you at a church near you. <laughs>